the Center for Transportation and Logistic Studies, known as PUSTRAL, Universitas Gajah Mada, was established in 2001 as a research and training institution in UGM. In line with the UGM's research roadmap, PUSTRAL carries out various studies in transportation and logistic with an expertise in an infrastructure system design and planning as well as management related to economics and business policy institution and regulation social culture safety and environment as well as telematic and information system in addition to research Postal also organized various trainings and tra on transportation, logistic and spatial planning, dissemination of various study results as well as discussion of recent topics are another agendas of the center. These activities are conducted through seminars which are held every month. Pustra also actively releases some publications such as books, papers, and popular writings in the mass media. In addition to those, our researchers are often invited as a speakers in various seminars and discussions nationally and worldwide. We looking forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, our session is about to begin. For offline participants, we hope that you can find a comfortable seat. And for the online participants, uh, we appreciate it if you can turn on your camera. Thank you. Hello, participants of the 6th International Conference on Indonesian Architecture and Planning, ECF 2022. Good morning. Once again, we are elated to welcome the online and offline participants to join the 6th International Conference on Indonesian Architecture and Planning, ECF 2022. We hope that everyone is doing well. My name is Cinta Priyana, your host for today with my partner here by my side. Nadia Marshanda, and before we begin the event, we'd like to greet the Honorable, the Chairman and the Vice Chairman of the 6th International Conference on Indonesian Architecture and Planning, the Honorable the Head of Architecture and Planning Department, Universitas Gajah Mada, Insinyur Deva Foster Harold Daswasto, STMSJ, PhD, IPM. The Honorable the Invited Speakers of the 6th International Conference on Indonesian Architecture and Planning. The Honorable the Steering and the Organizing Committee of the 6th International Conference on Indonesian Architecture and Planning and all of the distinguished participants. Ladies and gentlemen, the 6th International Conference on Indonesian Architecture and Planning is a series of conferences that allow the participants to discuss challenges and opportunities for sustainability, which often triggers innovation at the first place and its effect on architecture, planning, and the governance. This year, EGF is conducted under the theme of Beyond Sustainability, Beyond the Sustainability in Design, Planning, Innovation, which brought up five topics. The first one is the Beyond Sustainable Urban and Regional Development. The second one is Beyond Sustainable Architectural Design. The third one is Innovations for Sustainability. The next one is Responsive Environment. And the last one is the Challenges for Sustainability. This year, the 6th International Conference on Indonesian Architecture and Planning is held through collaboration through various uh, parties, respectively the Universitas Gajah Mada and lots of invited speakers from various global universities which are from Austria, Malaysia, London to Australia. Before we begin the event, allow us to announce today's rundown. This event will be started by the invited speaker session, and then the next one is the parallel sessions, and then we will have the coffee break and networking session, and then we'll continue it with another parallel sessions, and we will close it with the closing ceremony of the ETF 2022. On the closing ceremony, there will be a winner announcement of the EGF student competition and best paper award that we believe most of the participants here are waiting for. So please stay and watch our event until the end. Now we've done our opening session, ladies and gentlemen. Let's begin our today's rundown with the insightful material sessions from our inspiring speakers. 
And the session will be moderated by the Honorable Mr. Dodi Aditya Iskandar, STMCP PhD. So to Mr. Dodi Aditya Iskandar, the stage is yours. Thank you, and um, good morning to all participants and also distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Amila, Professor Pradipton, and also uh, Dr. Uh, Emmanuel Ko. Uh, today's uh, session, uh, we are fortunate enough to have uh, scholars, distinguished scholars uh, from all around the world who will present uh, their research, uh, their current research, and we will, they will share their experience and their knowledge uh, regarding their field of study. Uh, before I invite uh, all speakers uh, to stage, uh, I will read uh, their CV, uh, starting from uh, Dr. Emmanuel Koh. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel Koh uh, is an assistant professor at the Singapore University of Technology and Design, and he specializes in architecture and sustainable design and design and artificial intelligence. And he will uh, present uh, his research regarding machine learning um, that can be applied uh, for the urban sustainability. And the second speaker, uh, uh, can I allow, uh, uh, am I allowed to sit? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and, the, and the second uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Amila Zawawi, uh, she currently holds the position as the Director of uh, Research uh, Management Center at University of Technology Petronas, Malaysia. And she has uh, 22 years of experience, uh, which is quite remarkable. Uh, regarding, uh, this is quite interesting, uh, decommissioning, uh, rich decommissioning, uh, and also um, uh, she provides training on decommissioning to the industry in Malaysia and South Korea, and she also worked closely with various industry and university collaborators, especially uh, NPOs and NGOs, and she currently leads the UTP initiative for Pet Petronas on decommissioning, and also she uh, already published uh, over 70 articles on her research refining and she uh, completely passionate about championing the development of local capability and decommissioning. And the third uh, speaker is Professor uh, Eugenius uh, Pradipta. Uh, uh, he, he is a lecturer uh, at the Department of Architecture and Urban Planning and he specializes in uh, building science and building technology. And he already uh, published uh, several articles, and he also published book, and he has uh, several patents uh, related to his uh, research. So without uh, further ado, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Amila and also Professor uh, Pradipto to come to stage. And once uh, we have uh, Professor Pradipto and Dr. Amila uh, in the stage, we will uh, start uh, our session by uh, invite uh, also Dr. Uh, Emmanuel Koh to present uh, uh, his presentation. Dr. Amila and uh, Professor Pradito, I would like to extend our uh, welcome and would like to invite you uh, to the stage. So our first uh, presentation uh, will be from uh, Dr. Emmanuel Ko, and, and he is an assistant professor at the Singapore University of Technology and Design, and his presentation is regarding uh, the application of machine learning uh, related to the urban sustainability. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel Ko, uh, the time is yours. And you have uh, right. 25 minutes uh, to present uh, uh, your work. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, let me share my screen now. Uh, give me a second. Yeah. Uh, are you able to see this slide? Yeah. Okay. 
Right. Um, yeah, uh, shall, I, shall, shall I start? Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can, we can hear you loud and clear. Right. Okay, great. Um, right. So thanks, uh, the ICIAP uh, organizing committee for, invite, for the invitation, and also especially to uh, Vishnu uh, Hadanshia, uh, whom I first met a year ago, and he was the one who first wrote to me uh, about this event. Um, so today I will talk about... Um, um, I would look at three different projects uh, um, as, as a way to, to discuss um, the role of ML, uh, the role of machine learning towards urban sustainability. But before doing so, uh, I thought it might be quite useful to give a, kind of a quick snapshot of the, the broader context uh, within which I, I operate um, with my design research lab called Artificial Architecture. So. Uh, these are some of the, of course, today I'll be mainly talking about um, the urban context, but I, I do other uh, kind of sort of research that are related or rather underlined, supported by uh, the use of AI, deep learning, uh, especially. Um, so it, some of the works that, that uh, previously appeared in kind of a design context, like the Venice Architecture Finale, or, or even uh, designing of uh, different design artifacts like uh, the recent Golden Pin Design Award. But I also do more technical uh, um, research, uh, such as the one uh, in uh, AI conferences uh, like the ICCV, the International Conference on Computer Vision. A recent paper was uh, published uh, a year ago. Um, and other industry uh, projects uh, with many of the local agencies like the URA, the Urban Redevelopment Room Authority, uh, the Ministry of uh, Defense, and uh, also other contexts uh, such as um, uh, with the Royal uh, Anthropological Institute and also the, uh, uh, the Institute of um, Empirical Aesthetics. But today I'll mainly talk about the uh, urban side of things. Uh, for those who are interested in my work uh, in especially the design work uh, in architecture. Uh, you can find them in these uh, recent publications as well, such as the, um, <clears throat> the architecture in the age of AI, um, AI and architecture from research to practice and uh, the recent uh, AD uh, publication called Machine Hallucination. Um, and also there, it, there will be a discussion about the, the books uh, of which uh, I wrote one as well um a uh, discussion sometime in november uh so do tune in if you are interested uh in the discussion of the of these uh, new books All right so rather than starting with uh the list of uh, un sustainable development goals i thought it might be quite useful to uh more broadly uh, uh look at the term sustainability um so in this case uh taken from uh uh, Investopedia, um, the ability to maintain or support a process continue, uh, continuously over time, or according to the Oxford Dictionary, is um, the ability to continue or be continued for a long time. This deliberate broadening and even suspension of its meaning is, is useful, especially for today, as we try to explore and uh, project possible roles of uh, machine learning uh, upon the subject of uh, sustainability. So now by then borrowing our previous definition of sustainability, you can now likewise define the role of machine learning as follow. Um, the ability to learn con continuously over time, or according to the Oxford Dictionary more precisely, it is um, a subset of artificial intelligence in which computers use huge amounts of data to learn how to do tasks rather than being programmed to do them. So what we have just done is an attempt to couple both uh, sustainability uh, and machine learning. And, and let's then now look, relook at the entire phrase, uh, machine learning towards urban sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be defined as follow. <clears throat> the ability to learn, maintain, or support an urban process continuously over time and space. So we can understand urban process whether morphologically, uh, economically, social, social uh, aspect of it, or even environmental aspect of it. Um, so I'm going to be 
kind of a common understanding. Uh, we're now on the same page, ready to encounter some of the projects that I will talk about. So uh, I kind of roughly split the presentation, uh, the approach, this so-called the ability to learn from three different angles. Um, first, machine reading, then machine seeing, machine moving. Um, so you, you probably saw those uh, words in parentheses. Uh, um, essentially, these are the uh, techniques uh, derived uh, or rather adapted uh, from the AI domain for the urban domain. So what we will do uh, later on, you will see quite uh, clearly the parallel between the use of uh, techniques in natural language processing as we uh, uh, try to read the city, uh, the use of uh, computer vision um, with uh, convolutional neural networks uh, to understand uh, satellite imagery, for instance, and machine moving um, is when uh, a project, an ongoing project um, with the Urban Redevelopment Authority uh, using agent-based systems to understand uh, with graph neural networks to, to, to better understand the causal relations uh, between conflict within uh, the, the mobility conflict uh, within buildings and within the city. So um, let me continue. Uh, so start, starting with the first one, uh, for those who are interested to learn more about the details, you can check out the uh, Kedra 2022 paper, uh, which I co-authored with uh, Liu Nuozhi, um, who's my researcher, uh, titled Machine Reading Places and Spaces, Generative Probabilistic Modeling of Urban Thematic Zones and Contexts. Quite a mouthful, but essentially the objective uh, is to use ML, machine learning, to read the city for uncovering the relationship between the functions of spaces and the perceptions of places. Right? We know uh, that uh, as part of the UN, the SDG 11, uh, it is about sustainable cities and communities. So this, this idea that is necessary to recognize as we urbanize is necessary to recognize the diversity of places, which would then make cities more inclusive and uh, more participatory. Um, previous studies has been made um, um, uh, to mainly classify urban region, but in this particular study, we're trying to do it in a more bottom-up way to understand the relationship between the perception of a place and its so-called designated function as a space. Um, with that, then one could more effectively allocate uh, allocate resources uh, in the urban in in the city, and also monitor changes uh, of land use. So some of the um, uh, gaps uh, in existing literature is that yes, we do see research using big data uh, done with different data sources like the Foursquare, Twitter, TripAdvisor, Instagram. Um, we also see uh, research using uh, NLP, natural language processing, uh, um, as a way to approach uh, or understand the city uh, in different countries. But uh, almost none or rarely we see any that try to synthesize the function of space and the perception of place. Um, so in this case, for instance, uh, we see that often we see uh, regions um, uh, land use as with a very specific function, residential, commercial, so on and so forth. But um, what if we could have a, a, a kind of a more broadened um, uh, insights into the way in which we could categorize them. Um, right, so this is the research workflow for this particular project. So first, uh, the for the function of spaces, uh, we use TripAdvisor metadata, uh, um, which actually indicate uh, rather detailed information, such as whether it's a place for sightseeing, landmarks, or fine dining, uh, restaurants. And for the perception of place, it seems to, to us to make sense that we look at Instagram, uh, which is uh, using Instagram location tracking data. Uh, but rather than using an image, we're using the captions because we think that it probably more directly ex expresses uh, how people think about the place. Um, so with these uh, two different data sources, uh, we then um, uh, able to retrieve the function and the perceptual uh, thematic zones of these places. 
so in the end, we then propose uh, uh, diversity and uh, uniqueness in indices uh, to compare among regions. So next, we look at the pipeline of such a data uh, um, processing. So we have the points of interest, meaning the points that we we found in uh, TripAdvisor or Instagram, and then we um, because they, they tend to be quite sparse and and skilled in in to, you know especially in high dense high density area. So we aggregate them into hexagon with five hundred meters radius. Uh, and then we use topic modeling, which is a technique uh, used in natural language processing to extract the latent features, um, the hidden variables, um, so that each region will then be categorized with a thematic zone um, that comes out of the, the uh, machine learning process. And, and let me uh, present the intuition behind topic modeling. So more specifically, the topic modeling approach that have uh, been used is the LDA, latent uh, Dirichlet lit uh, allocation. So you can imagine that uh, in the case of text, right, uh, each top, um, in the case of text, uh, we can understand that each topic is a distribution over words. So usually in, in the normal usage of uh, topic uh, modeling is to classify documents, right? Given a document, how do you classify it? So in this particular example, for instance, uh, we have a piece of text. And uh, it shows that there are some uh, words that represent topics uh, uh, in the in, in the text, such as urban planning, ar architecture design, probability, mark of chains, so and so forth. It would be quite straightforward if that that particular document uh, covers, uh, let's say, just architecture. Very straightforward to classify. But in this particular example, uh, it is a mix, a mixture of three different topics, the urban architecture and also statistics uh, in the case of the probability of Markov chain. So we could then understand that uh, if we conceptualize each uh, topic as a distribution over words and each document as a distribution over topics, we could then migrate this same understanding and transfer it uh, to the urban domain. So in this case, um, the document is now our urban region, shown here as hexagon. And the topics uh, that we saw just now, uh, they are now our urban thematic zones. Um, so instead of uh, meaning the programs, right, and with the perception and function. So instead of trying to classify an urban region uh, based on either it's a residential or commercial zone, we now conceptualize it as a mixture of different um, zones. And each of the zone um, has, a, 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 each of the region has a distribution of different thematic zones. And that would enrich our understanding of uh, these uh, spaces um, beyond a kind of a fixated way of, of thinking about land use. Um, so here we could, in fact, compute the joint distribution uh, and the LDA can run the generative process to generate the thematic zones. I mean, you can ignore the, the formula, but the idea is to, to uh, compute the joint distribution uh, probabilistically. Um, so here, uh, for, so we have the function the thematic zones that we uh, could retrieve from the uh, TripAdvisor data source um, for the, um, so we generate three functional, uh, th 30 functional thematic zones. And we can look at two of them, uh, two of the 30 different zones and see what constitute their, their top 10 functional elements. So here we can see that for instance, uh, TA7, uh, meaning uh, the, uh, from the trick advisor, the them function thematic zone, we could see that the this such a zone contains fun and games, entertainment, outdoor activities, which we do we do find them in regions near the national stadium or golf course. For those, uh, I, I suppose you are familiar with the, the very simple outline of the Singapore island. Uh, so this is this is done in the uh, using Singapore as a case study. And then the thematic, the other thematic zone, thematic zone 16, uh, we can see that it, it uh, is able to categorize a, uh, um, a collection, mainly th uh, distribution of three different um, uh, elements, the sites and landmarks, the, the uh, food and drinks and so on and so forth. 
Um, and we do see that the downtown and Geylang area, uh, they have relatively higher proportion of these themes. Um, and then we look at the Instagram uh, data source that we data set um, using the LDA. And then we also then uh, retrieve 30 different perceptual thematic zones. And from here, we can understand uh, quite interestingly, let's say the word happy appeared in many of the um, captions in on the Instagram post. Um, uh, although it exists everywhere, but we do see some uh, uh, nuances. For instance, in the thematic zone IG4, uh, in the first column, uh, uh, we see lots of uh, Instagram tags, uh, IG10. Uh, the second column mainly relates uh, to the family dinner, uh, that sort of program. Uh, and then 29, for instance, is uh, really about partying, uh, as you can see from the uh, text being extracted and uh, learned uh, from the Instagram captions. And with that, we, uh, with both uh, the functional thematic zones and the perceptual thematic zones, we then could approach to understand the uniqueness of a particular area, like well, how unique is this particular part of the city, for instance. And the, the very fact that our LDA model could assign a, a value we could compute the uh, uniqueness index as a summation of the differences of the regions value with those other regions, those of the other regions. So for instance, we could see that uh, the most unique places, or at least in Singapore, according to this research, would be, let's say, the National Stadium, uh, the Henderson Park, um, and uh, where and the hill, right? Um, which which uh, grant a very nice uh, panoramic view of the city. And, we can then compute the correlations between the uniqueness and the diversity of each region. And, and uh, interestingly, we found strongly negative correlations, meaning uh, um, a region is more unique. Uh, if it's more unique, it tends to be dominated by uh, certain types of thematic zones. Um, so this is the, the, the paper on uh, machine uh, uh, reading. Uh, I'll now more quickly move on to the next uh, part, which is machine seeing. So um, this is actually the more visual section of the presentation today. For those who are interested in finding out the details, you can check out the papers from, from 2019 called uh, Citizen Visual Search Engine Detection and Curation of Urban Objects. Um, mostly deep learning, using deep learning for classification of uh, urban objects, uh, infrastructure objects. Uh, I'm sorry, Which, Dr. Kong, uh, you only have uh, five minutes left. Oh, is it not 25 yeah, minutes? Yeah, you only have five minutes left. Thank you. Uh, five minutes left. Oh, okay. Let me just move, move very quickly. Okay, uh, the roads. So these are the items. Um, for instance, uh, we can understand if we, we could use satellite imagery to understand uh, the distribution of uh, paved road and uh, safe road, meaning safe and unsafe road. Uh, interestingly, in the case of uh, 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 Wakadudu in Africa um, or other African uh, cities, we see that the high traffic uh, uh, death uh, being witnessed. So the project essentially tried to extract um, uh, satellite imagery and then understand uh, I'll probably skip this part because the time is quite limited. But the, the idea is this, we have, we could extract the, the satellite imagery and then we use the annotation from the uh, OpenStreetMap uh, as a proxy to understand whether the road is safe or not by framing it as unpaved and paved road. And with that, we can create a Google Map uh, um, app in this case, uh, tra traveling from A to B, uh, instead of being the shortest uh, path would be the safest. So what you see in green are the safest and those in red are uh, the most uh, dangerous. And this is how the, 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 the uh, satellite imagery uh, looks like with the segmentation. So, and this is uh, looking at the photovoltaic uh, panels to understand the ecological, the ecological um, uh, take of each pro, uh, pro, um, uh, cantons in, in Switzerland. This, this was done much earlier on. So in this case, uh, as the video shows is to see which are the different candidates that uh, pay more attention to have more uh, solar panels on the roof of their buildings. Uh, and we could then measure the, the uh, ecological uh, um, uh, take by each of the uh, um, city planners, uh, or in this case, the cantons. 
Right, so my, maybe just more move more quickly. Um, so what you have here is this, right? We could zoom in into the, or we could zoom in the parts. So the parts that are yellow represent buildings uh, with uh, satellite uh, roof pan, uh, sorry, with uh, uh, photovoltaics uh, on their roof. So we could then do the counts to understand the distribution. The other project, which is about trees. So instead of counting the number of trees that uh, in each of the cantons in Switzerland, we count each of the pixels that suggest that it's a tree in order to understand the distribution uh, of a green co uh, coverage uh, in the city or in the country. Uh, so we train a model, uh, a deep neural networks model as well, uh, like the previous two projects as well, um, mainly for classification and using that uh, to look at the satellite imagery of those uh, uh, different parts of uh, Switzerland. So if I just go quite quickly, I know we have limited time. Uh, we can compare different cities, right? The the more we could then understand the green distribution as we saw here, yeah? So this is how each of the cantons look like. If we uh, use uh, that to understand the coverage, these are some images that uh, using deep neural networks, we could do the prediction, do the cementation. And this is the whole process, uh, which then includes a more important aspect of the car usage in that particular cantons and, and uh, in addition to this uh, information. Um, this one are uh, not uh, deep learning, but machine learning, meaning we're trying to understand the infrastructure and maintenance of uh, different spots, uh, uh, infrastructures like the tennis court, and we could use template matching to understand if uh, some of the tennis courts or football pitch are not very well maintained. This one I'll skip more quickly. Uh, this project, um, not so much related to cities, but let me just uh, it, nah, just skip it. I know I have limited time. Um, yeah, I thought I got 25 minutes. So I'm using about two, 21 minutes so far. Um, so I, th I think I'm just gonna yeah. rouse through. So this this yeah, other uh, project Dr. is- Kong, I'm sorry, uh, you only have five mi uh, one minute left, so. If you can okay. uh, jump into right. your conclusion. I'll just uh, jump, jump through. Uh, So this project is to understand how we will perceive uh, artists perceive places. So we have uh, a deep neural networks to generate the what an artist would draw, an architect in fact, would draw when looking at a cityscape just to extract the important aspects of the city and also using eye tracking uh, devices to understand the city and using machine learning to extract uh, the patterns. Uh, this I will skip. Um, Yep, I think uh, I will just move very quickly, uh, skip everything <clears throat> and end with this video, All right? This uh, this video is just like uh, 10 seconds. So we could use, um, so I talk about seeing, uh, moving, reading, but we also could think about machine learning as a generative uh, agency where you could, in this case, learning lots of uh, building, high-rise building, in this case, the public housing in Singapore, to generate um, building design. Um, in that sense, uh, it is a very different way of thinking about the role of machine learning uh, beyond just purely uh, about sustainability from an environmental perspective, but also in the form of uh, our creative res resource uh, as a generative model. Yep. Uh, I think I'll end it here. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Koff, for the presentation. And I believe that uh, this is an uh, eye-opener uh, for all of us, especially uh, those who have um, interests or research interests um, on uh, urban uh, planning, urban design, and also um, the way uh, we develop uh, approach, a, self, a certain approach on um, let uh, or utilize uh, data from uh, social media uh, that help us uh, guide uh, the way we develop a plan or design, especially at the uh, city level or at the area level or district level. And also, uh, we already see uh, so many uh, possibilities that we can use uh, with regard to the machine learning, but 
uh, I believe uh, 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 during the discussion later on, uh, we will discuss, uh, perhaps uh, there are some questions uh, coming from uh, participants also from the audience uh, regarding the, perhaps the shortcoming, the shortcoming of the, the application of the machine learning uh, within the field of uh, planning and design. But let, let us uh, save uh, the questions uh, later on, uh, and we'll move to the second speaker. Uh, the second speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Amila, Amila Zawawi, and she will uh, present uh, her research regarding um, uh, beyond uh, sustainability uh, in decommissioning uh, project. Uh, Dr. Amila, uh, the time is yours. Okay. So loud. <laughs> so loud. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, the slide will be projected here. Okay. Okay. So um, I am going to take you outside from urban area, outside from onshore inland. I'm going to take you offshore. Okay, and I'm going to take you outside the domain of normal people. We're going to go into oil and gas. So it's going to be outside of everything, uh, given the context of this conference. Yeah? Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right, so uh, you can see from the title. Um, can I see just a quick show of hand? How many people? know about decommissioning? Two, three? I know because you both, I was talking to you uh, just now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the rest does not know decommissioning? No. Okay, uh, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so that's the question. What is decommissioning? We go to the next one. Next slide. Yeah. All right. So this is decommissioning. Uh, in onshore, normal uh, construction, they would say uh, demolition normally. Yeah. Uh, so decommission, decommissioning referring to a phase whereby uh, if you build a building, for example, there will come a point where that building does not serve the purpose it was built for. For example, you build a mosque. And then one day, that mosque is no longer performing as a mosque. So you, what are you going to do with it? In oil and gas industry, usually in offshore, for Indonesia, for Malaysia, we have a lot of offshore structures where you go to the offshore and then you build this platform. They call it a platform or oil rig. The Americans call it oil rig. Then you build it so that you can do the oil production uh, at the sea. When the time comes that the oil is no longer producing at that platform, then the international maritime law say that you have to remove it. You cannot leave it there because you know oil and gas, they have been reached by this and now you don't need it, you cannot just abandon it. And then it also uh, pose a safety issue to the sea, to the ships that is passing by. Kan? So that, that, this is the term, they call it decommissioning, some people call it abandonment, removal, disposal. Indonesia sometimes refer to it as uh, abandonment and site restoration, asset retirement. There are various um, terminology. Some quarters, especially the Greenpeace people, would also call this dumping. Hmm? Uh, in fact, in the North Sea, there's a law, a London Dumping Act which does not allow for you to leave the structure in the sea. Okay? So Malaysia, Indonesia, the Asian region all subscribe to the uh, international maritime law. And that, by that means that all these platform owner, Pertamina, Petronas, um, Thailand, they have what? Uh, Chevron, PTTEP, the owner. Once you end of life, you got to find ways, what are you going to do with it? And I am also say that if you find another purpose for it, then you can leave it there. You don't have to remove it. Otherwise, you've got to cut off the leg and take it away and do something with it. Nah. Okay, next. We go to the next slide. Right, so why? Okay, this is my research. And I, I think you can tell I'm very passionate about it. <laughs> okay, I've been looking at this uh, idea of decommissioning uh, for almost 10 years now. The market is huge. 
Okay, it's huge because there are a lot of platforms in the world, and Southeast Asia region actually have about 1,700 offshore platforms. Indonesia have the largest; they have about 600 over. Malaysia is about less than 400. And most of these platforms, actually about 50% already reached their end of production life, means that they are candidate for decommissioning. It's a good potential business if you are the service provider, you want to give service to remove. But for the platform owner, it's a huge cost because this asset is no longer producing money. Right? Okay, we go to the next uh, slide. Okay, so this is Gulf of Mexico. The, all the red dots are offshore platform. So they have about uh, 4,000 structures at any one time. And they have decommissioned, they have removed for 5,000 platforms since 1973. This, is num this number is actually huge, about 100 platforms a year. Why? Because the Gulf of Mexico is very prone to a hurricane. Yeah? Hurricane, all, all the uh, environmental implications that cause the platform to be unsafe or the, it topples, so they have to remove all business as usual, end of production life. The North Sea, UK, about 200 over platform. They have decommissioned 20, that's a very small number. Norwegian also have about 20 platforms and they have decommissioned about a lot. Uh, the Netherlands as well. We go to the next slide. I want to bring you back home to Asian. These are the numbers that we managed to compile. So I mentioned we have about 1,700 fixed offshore platforms, 500 plus about to decom. Uh, Malaysia 360, Thailand about 450, Vietnam uh, 60, Indonesia 600 plus and Brunei. We couldn't find out what's the actual number of fixed structure but they have a lot of onshore structure. Now, um, for, for the audience today, uh, why I am sharing this because I think there are huge potential for uh, architects to come in yeah to look when you want to look about sustainability this is one sector of the industry that really need fresh idea for sustainability removing if you count the uh, carbon emission when you need to remove is actually a lot of impact to the environment so the safer more cost effective option is actually to continue the structure where it is at uh, my basic idea that I'm going to talk about today is about repurpose or reuse of this structure with the option not to remove it from wherever it is at now. Okay, uh, we go to the next one. Okay, this is me. This is my, I, I mentioned I've been doing this for almost 10 years now. <laughs> okay, not moving much. So this is me in new territory, Blue Ocean appealing to the architects to come on board with me. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Okay, this is the journey, right? Uh, most of the, the, my approach will be in um, research, but we work closely with the industry collaborators, the owner, yeah? even Pertamina, uh, with SK Chemigas as well, you know, for Indonesia. Okay, we move to the next one. Okay, this is the first one, um, design for decom, they call it, yeah? Because offshore platform, when it was designed, imagine this is a pla uh, offshore platform. This is designed to be at sea for 25 years, minimum. But the design code that they used to build, they, they took it from the Gulf of Mexico or the North Sea, which is more advanced. Uh, the API, they call it. Yeah? So when they design here, our water is actually shallow water. It's about 100 meters. And most of the platform is in shallower water, about 30, 50 meters. Eh? So when we use more uh, stringent design code, our 25-year life design is actually lasting more than that. So you imagine yeah, the platform when the uh, production life ended, and you need to remove it, you actually do not need to remove it because the structure is still very good. Uh, so um, then the idea came very recently that maybe instead of designing something to be there forever, it's not supposed to be there forever, design it so that it can be relocated, decom, it can be decom. Once that field no longer produced, you pick it up 
and put it elsewhere. So that was what they did with uh, this uh, Ophir field. It's a field, it's a name of a field in the offshore. This platform is a wellhead platform using suction a pile. So whenever this field is a small field, marginal field, they call it, finish, no longer production, they pull out the platform, it's a small one, they tow it about 50 nautical miles and they install it in a new location. This is a very um, sustainable way of doing things. It's like you do modular building. You don't want that site anymore, I can just pack up and go. So that was the idea for Ophi. Huh? Okay, like a container house. Ah. You don't build a bungalow because when you build bungalow, it means that you want to stay there for 100 years, right? For your, for your children, grandchildren, grand, great, great, great grandchildren. So this is one of the things, uh, the idea designed for the com. Next one. Next slide, okay. Rigs to reef. Everybody knows that corals are dying everywhere, right? And our waters, we are tropical waters, coral thrive in condition about 30 meters. Yeah? So the idea came that the platform is already there. When you look at the platform, you look at the lake, the, 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 lake, the jacket they call it, there's a lot of uh, barnacles growing throughout the, the production life. So can we, the idea was, can we, when the platform is no longer producing, turn this structure into reefing? They call it rigs to reef, huh? on site. Uh, okay, so the idea, uh, this is a very nice idea, creating oasis from a desert ocean. So we go to the next slide. I'm gonna show you, this is me, promoting this since 2011. Because people say, okay, it's offshore, it's oil and gas, it's very dirty, you know, why you want to turn it into reef. But 10 minutes left already? Oh my gosh, okay, I'm going to go quickly because I got a lot of ideas. Okay, so this is us promoting this. Like we went to Singapore, we went everywhere. Next one. So we, we, we did the study, we brought in hydrodynamic modeling. Uh, we identify the point of coral sprawling, as uh, sprawling. Does it pass through the platform where it is at now? So the idea is that when it is decom, you just use that site as a reefing site. Uh, okay. So we, we did that. We did the modeling. Next one. Uh, so this is another one, the rig's evolution, turning the rig into something else. We started this with a civil engineering student, but unfortunately, civil engineering students are not creative. I, you know, they came up with concept, but I was like, oh, I wish they are more creative. So we go to the next slide because when I Google, okay, more, next one. This one is not pretty at all. Next one. Ah, this is by architects. This is by Arup Group. They use offshore platform because the, the site is clustered and they want to use it as a data center. You can tell this is a work by architect, right? Just now was by civil engineering. Next one. <laughs> Next one, we go to the next one. A lot of pretty pictures here. Next, next. See, architects, residential rigs. Hmm? This is for the Maldives. Maldives is island cluster, right? So if the ocean were to go through global warming, the sea level rise, they want to relocate, relocate Maldivian to this. Okay, next one. All these are by architects. See, eco resort. Imagine, yeah? you want to go to offshore, right? You want to experience how is life, right? Okay, this is the idea. Next one. Um, Biohabitat. You can tell this is by architects. And I love this. I wish the architects come in, tell, uh, re, uh, what do you call this? Turn the platform into this offshore structure. Next one. Um, okay, this is the, the more details. Lah. So it's basically self-sustainable. You grow things there, you get your own renewable energy and whatnot. And at the bottom, the rig will turn into your uh, snorkeling center, right? Okay, next one. Uh, this is in England. They took one platform that has been decommissioned. The name is literally Sea Monster. Okay, it's a platform from Netherlands. Uh, can you just click again? It's currently on display. If you're going to UK, you can go and see this. This is about 30 meter high. They have this, they even have waterfalls and whatnot. Uh, just to say that uh, the offshore platform can be sustainable. You, this one, they turn it into artwork. Lah. But in reality, it can be a real thing. 
Next one. Okay, this, this is when it came. When it came, then they installed it here in England. Next one. Okay, next one. It was really ugly before they turned it into so This is very, very bare, right? After that, you, you saw the end product just now. Next one. Okay, this was it. Mm. So it's there. If you happen to go to UK, you can still see it. Next one. Uh, this one is already there. The platform is in Sabah now. It's a, it's a diving site. You can go and then you can go diving around it. Uh, but the platform does not come from Malaysia. They bought it from elsewhere, from, from Gulf of Mexico, I think. Next one. This is a uh, sprawling city. Um, this is just to uh, click next one. This is just to give idea that this, uh, this was actually not offshore platform, uh, but the city was built on water. And, and there are offshore uh, oil production. But this gives me the idea that because the platform exists in cluster, when we ran out of land to live on, we actually can build a city in the offshore. Okay, next one. Eh, abyss. <laughs> Five minutes up. <laughs> okay, but you got the idea, right? Uh, so I was so excited that, okay, this is my opportunity to get buy-in from the architects. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Amila. Let us give applause uh, to Dr. Amila. And this is quite an interesting and thought-provoking uh, presentation coming from Dr. Amila. And I was wondering if you gave us a presentation like this uh, five, six years ago, perhaps I'll, I can move to your film and then join you. <laughs> because there are, there are so many potentials uh, uh, by looking at the, the number of oil rigs uh, that uh, need to be decommissioned and then uh, be put uh, uh, somewhere else. And, and, but again, since uh, I'm, I was an architect, uh, architect by train, and then I moved as a, a regional development planner, uh, there are so many questions uh, uh, left unanswered. Uh, one is uh, who, who finance uh, uh, this project and how, how can uh, look at the relationship between the, the owner of the property and also uh, the owner of uh, perhaps a Pertamina, Petronas, who, who who happened to uh, assign this to the Ulrich uh, property and also uh, the way uh, the community, the local community, uh, look at uh, this uh, facility when uh, the, the the property of the the the, the property owner uh, decides to move uh, this oil rig uh, uh, to the location uh, adjacent or nearby uh, the local community. But I think uh, we can discuss this uh, later on and. And uh, I think this is quite an interesting topic, by the way. Yeah. And uh, we move to our third uh, invited speaker. Um, uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Eugenius Pradipto. Um, he will present uh, his research regarding uh, building technology. Yeah. Uh, Prof Pradip, uh, the time is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Yeah, I just break a little bit, yeah, about the transitional house. <coughs> yeah, okay. This is the development of a uh, rivet axis of vernacular architecture as a response to globalization. Yeah, okay. Next thing, yeah. The continuous uh, development of globalization cannot be stopped, yeah. That is this problem. The however, vernacular architecture shall not be abandoned or discarded. The value it's recently in the fish climate and earthquake the states that have been tested and uh, a very widely to the study and even development. So that is my problem. That is the main problem is the vernacular architecture is not being able to keep up with the development of globalization in relation to human, example social, culture, economic, and development. Yeah. So that is the question. How to build vernacular architecture that can be innovative with globalization without losing identity or Characteristic from vernacular architecture. Yeah, okay. 
This is the Indonesian and vernacular architecture, yeah. it's spoken about the Indonesian geography, climate, yeah, and a physical space bond and vernacular architecture, microcosm and microcosm analogy and identity and vernacular architecture, finding of characteristic of Indonesian vernacular architecture, and so on the X be in the center of the building. Okay, next, yeah. This is the uh, Indonesian geography here. Yeah. That's Indonesian. It's directly adjacent to the Java Trust and they're located in the Ring of Fire area. Causing Indonesian to be prone to earthquake. Yeah. Therefore, most Indonesian vernacular architecture is built up on a flexible structure in response to earthquake. But in climate, yeah. According to Koppen Giger, climate classification map, there are three types. It is climate in Indonesia. This is the tropical uh, rainforest that it had in the precipitation, most likely appeared in West Indonesia. Yeah, in tropical monsoon. In tropical savanna, that is the lowest precipitation most likely appears in east yeah, monsoon. The different amounts of rain also has a big impact on how people in the patch building their vernacular architecture. This is between West Indonesian tropical rainforest, as is high precipitation. This is the roof and skin that is more open for the air circulation. Yeah. But in East Indonesian tropical savanna, this is lower precipitation, the rope and skin, less opening for air uh, circulation. Yeah, this is no opening, no is else, but uh, yeah, the air is terminated in inside. This is example. This is rumah adat Belu. Yeah, this is in is not. Uh, Nusa Tenggara, yeah, okay. This is macrocosm on microcosm, allergy and identity in vernacular architecture. Yeah. Indonesia need believe the concept of the macrocosm on microcosm be able to overcome the unique geography and non climatic condition in Indonesia. It is when the communication is com yeah, compromised and friendly with nature and the environmental, not again, it, yeah. A compromise attitude to life is based on the mythology that has a basic pattern that harmoniously united contradictory and opposite realities. The basic pattern is now in Bali as Nawasanga, yeah. When in Java is mancopat, yeah, yeah, mancopat. This is, <coughs> and yeah, get with that, yeah. That is my cosmos, my brothers, and uh, identity. That is, that is the representation of macrocosm on microcosm analog in vernacular architecture can be all seen via the. This is the uh, number one. That is the main room, act as the center of the point of the room around order in a uh, human world uh, that is a uh, equal place or human activity that is over the world yeah a middle world and underworld yeah underworld that is dimension yeah the human a place uh, for the uh, the middle yeah? that is place for a uh, human activity the second, that is the main room, unified and balancing the room around. Yeah. The, uh, that, yeah, that is the main room, act as the vertical and horizontal axis of the world's building. That is connection to God or to the human being. Yeah. So the uh, access place, yeah, being in the center of the building. Not only in Bali or in Java, 
Yeah, the macrocosm or microcosm analogs also appear in several vernacular houses in Indonesia. That's a poor example. That is in uh, West Java or uh, Indonesian. Yeah, that is by Oma Sabua. Yeah, that is in Nias. Oh, uh, Batak Karo. That is by the North South Matra. By the Eastern Indonesian. This is Werpu. Yeah. Unau uh, Pelu, ya yeah, Pelu in Badem S uh, Nusa Tenggara. Unda de Badem Badem Meter Indonesian. This is uh, excuel, uh, example in Tongkongan Badem uh, Toraja and Celebes, yeah, Sud Celebes. Particularly in the main room and the robe is united so that the people. From below can see in the highest rope tip, yeah, that is the relic bowl. And the, what is considered then uh, the most, yeah, this is the exit, okay, the defining characteristic of Indonesian vernacular. The access space, the access space is marked by a direct relation between the main room and the Tip, yeah, of the root replace is a social, a cultural characteristic, and with various features that complement it, the function as an indoor climate control with the walls building. The access space as keeper of the balance of the surrounding environment, the hallmarks of the landmarks are clear. Identity on uh, the character become the uh, strong by the looking at the role of the roof covering in determining the climate condition of the room. The relation between the main room and the roof place form uh, in spirit axis. This is the axis space becomes the key for the vernacular architecture identity. Yeah. Yeah, this will be access place behind the uh, center of the building. Yeah, then the access space is the market by the existing connection between the main room and the tip of the roof. Yeah, give an impression that the area is most vital secret in the building. The tip is a uh, highest roof. This is the rigid uh, pool. Yeah, it's outside the center of building that's it yeah, the outside the not <coughs> center building yeah that the that is not the, the tip of the hike so the uh, uh, the center yeah <coughs> the tip of the hike center a roof the upper camp the temporal uh, vernacular building, such as the Kampung Naga, the traditional house in Tasik Malaysia, in Sao Ono, in Ngada, is Nusa Tenggara, have access space on the eight. Yeah. So, this is the access space, don't yeah, have to be in the perfect center. Okay, yeah. So, he must have some correction. <laughs> yeah. The traditional vernacular uh, architecture in Indonesia have two strong character. Yeah, the uh, first is the roof that used to deal with climate, and the second is the existing door access space, which further help the, the hot uh, air move towards the roof and later escape from the building. Yeah. 
how do we create an emotion that is uh, possible for the access space principle to be safe in position, not necessarily in middle. Yeah, we send a correction. Group and access cannot be spirit, can later the term become roof's access. The roof access is important. To maintain and combine yeah, the characteristic of the roof and axis yeah, uh, access place. Yeah. Look at the reason yeah, from Kampung Naga and uh, Naga, traditional house, the road fit axis, then uh, does not have to be in in the center of the building, yeah. That is, roof access can be placed anywhere as long as it has the highest roof yeah, access and a main Indonesian particular architecture characteristic to respond to globalization. So that is the application of uh, roof fit access, yeah. A characteristic of vernacular architecture to respond to globalization. This is my erparung, uh, my uh, 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 experiment. Yeah. Okay. That is. Uh, I have. I have. Uh, I think uh, project. Yeah. I think project. Yeah. But the next and get. Yeah. That is. The first is this rumah suatu terjadi. This is the where the roofs exist, yeah. The roof exists in prison building, yeah. This is a private resident. Yeah, this is the roof pits uh, access room as the center of balance in the right in the center of the building. Yeah, the living room. That is not living room. It's, but the family room, yeah. Family room is marked with the large and high room space with the strong light, yeah. And resident can directly see the rex pole from the living room, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is the project, yeah. This is the roof with access, yeah, room with high room space and the strong slide, yeah, resident can directly see the rectal pole from the room, yeah. This is second, yeah, this is an gallery, that is Tembi gallery, that is the rope, uh, rope access in between the anger space, yeah. This is my project, so this is in the case of the anger long access, that is 15 more, uh, four meter, yeah. The roof access room is placed in the middle. It is used to enter the light and to remove hot air rising toward yeah. the top hole. The finishing of the space of the along it is conditioned evenly. Yeah. The third thing that is Oma Soko Guru, that is our an resident family. Yeah. <clears throat> the roof access is between the longest space. The roof with access room is placed in the middle is the use in the lights and the remove yeah. hot air rising toward the top hole. The division of the space in the elanet side is condition and everything. Yeah, this is by the pangsari, that is by that's under. This is an uh, uh, soccer guru or mind column building being arranged like a uh, invited as a pyramid. Yeah. It's places about the mind room as a feature of roof with access room. Yeah. This is the natural light, the strength, the position of the roof with access room. Get wider. This is an chur, clothed. This is one bambus, yeah. <coughs> bambus construction. This is roof access on the corner side. Yeah. 
It is better ready to spare than pressing the roof's access room on the corner, providing the wider function space. The role of the uh, roof's access room as the central style of fear with a greater light intensity. And hex rope hex, and is also reinforced by the roof support structure system. Yeah. Good, right there. Yeah, this is but this uh, prepon column, it is <clears throat> and a gross uh, space, yeah. The long rope and structure system over forty until uh, eighty meter in length support the roof foot. The access room at the corner. Yeah. This is an musola. This is an musola. This is access space on the one of the each side. Yeah. This is our other religious building. Perfect at a large common space, the fry room that has the same direction and orientation and is free from obstruction. The root access room is a good. Does not lost in character by the uh, high floor and ceiling and strong uh, intensity and centralist decoration. Yeah, that is the Joglo L. Yeah, it is the hotel tempi. The access space as at the direct connection space between the level. This is an two level two stock. The roof access room present on the void cave. It has a unity form of the rooms and up level with the also in the center of air circulation to the full air uh, flow forward the roof. We can see the rigid pole from the first floor. Okay, that's the same. That is bamboo shelter at city mall. That is a space at the direct connection space between the level. Yeah. The roof access room, Persian, the boy, uh, given the unit from outer room. At each level will also at the center of air circulation on the full of air flow toward the roof. Yeah. We can see the red pole from the first floor. That is, this is the, <coughs> the projector. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Yeah, that is the ledger. That is Omah Kebun. That is access space as a indirect connection space between level. The floor can function or differ between level along as yeah. There is room again for the air to move up and escape down to Esther. Roof access space don't have to be visual connected between level as long as the hot air can ask a motor at the gap. Okay. Good? Yeah. Summary. Yeah. The roof asset become the key character of Indonesian in particular architecture and the roof and access space are in the uh, is spareable unit. Yeah. Roof access can be placed anywhere as long as in the uh, height is a roof as in the mine access character. The roof access don't have to be in, in the perfect center and this flexible open the placement as on the access can be provided flexible for developing the vernacular architecture to fall in the rhythm and globalization without losing its character. The rep access united the room around it's done have to be in the large one. The rock access has community between the level. The connection sets don't have the, to be uh, actual open, but it can be formed as a holes to get the head out. I to move the, uh, around the roof axis must all have support to strengthen yeah, the roll and generate the rooms around. For example, the roof axis is, is the biggest room with the many light holes and the river and the older structure are heading to the roof axis. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof. Pradipto, for the nice uh, presentation. And again, uh, 
it reminded me uh, back when I was an architectural student and we were expected to look at uh, the, the traditional structure, um, the local values and how we could deploy those uh, traditional value, local values um, to uh, respond to what you, you said uh, earlier, uh, globalization or so-called uh, contemporary issues of architecture and also planning. So this is quite interesting. And before we move to the question and answer session, uh, I would like to uh, provide uh, some uh, brief summary uh, to what um, the first presenter, Dr. Emmanuel Ko, and the second presenter, Dr. Amila Zawawi, and the third presenter, uh, Prof. Uh, Pradeep uh, already uh, gave us. Uh, we look at uh, from uh, Dr. Emmanuel Ko perspective, we could uh, learn how to deploy uh, the machine learning to utilize or perhaps to create uh, some sort of uh, new technique, new method, both in uh, planning and uh, design. And it, it gives us a new perspective on how to. Uh, utilize uh, social data and then incorporate this in, into the planning uh, process and also a design process. And it's quite interesting. And when we look at the, the way uh, Dr. Amila Zawawi uh, did uh, for the past uh, 10 years, we now see uh, the way oil rig structure as a new entity that we could uh, uh, or we could give, uh, or we could breathe some new life and some uh, new meaning. And this is uh, lots of opportunities that uh, can be made uh, 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 by drawing from uh, Dr. Amila Zawawi uh, experience and from a perspective of Prof. Pradipta, we could see that even though uh, those are uh, local values, uh, traditional values, traditional um, uh, norms, uh, those uh, could be utilized, could be deconstructed, and could be cre uh, used uh, to create a new perspective or a new structure with a new meaning. And that uh, helped us uh, uh, in, uh, in defining new perspective on what we call uh, sustainability. We no longer uh, define sustainability as a fuzzy concept uh, where we could tweak um, uh, to whatever we would like uh, to uh, put uh, definition uh, to sustainability. But we could create a new application and that help us uh, put uh, some new definition perspective on either uh, the structure, uh, building, and even uh, urban uh, area, urban um, or regional uh, uh, area. And audience and also um, a participant um, who participate uh, through online uh, platform. We then move to the question and answer session uh, or discussion uh, session. And I would like to invite uh, three uh, participants uh, who would like to ask questions to our uh, distinguished uh, speakers, um, uh, either to Dr. Ko, uh, Dr. Amila, and also uh, Prof. Pradeep. Perhaps uh, there are questions or uh, comments coming from participants, both uh, offline and uh, also who participate uh, through online uh, platform. Uh, I have one uh, from Pak Wisnu and two. Um, and also I, I see uh, uh, questions uh, coming from uh, Fari, uh, Farid uh, Nazaruddin. Okay. Um, I would like to read uh, questions from Farid Nazaruddin, and the question is directed to uh, Dr. Ko. Uh, he asks about uh, what is uh, Dr. Ko's suggestion regarding the next generation on how to use machine learning so it will not. So it will not. Oh, so it, uh, okay. So, what is your suggestion uh, regarding the next generation on the application or the deployment uh, of machine learning? And he quotes uh, Albert Einstein that uh, Albert Einstein uh, stated that he feared the day technology will surpass human interaction and the world will have generation of uh, idiots. So it's quite, quite, uh, quite a citation uh, coming from Albert Einstein. And the uh, second question is from uh, Pak Vishnu. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Wisnu Adiansyah. Uh, thank you very much for learning about your works or to all the distinguished spe uh, speakers today. And I'm so excited by the diverse approach that we have in relation to talking about the sustainability aspect and uh, related to uh, Professor Emmanuel Koch, I first learned about his project a few years ago, and I'm really impressed about how the machine could aid us as a designer uh, to find the way the uh, approach that we might, uh, we, we might be overlooked uh, when we try to use a traditional approach in designing. And also about the topic from Dr. Amil, I first learned about the work uh, decommissioning several years ago as well. Uh, several of my colleagues doing this uh, decommissioning of small uh, village in uh, Svalbard in Norway. Uh, that is uh, sitting on top of uh, some ice glacier that is melting away. And also from the last topic of vernacularity that is uh, presented by Professor Pradipto. So um, my question would be, but if we talk about the topic of sustainability itself, if we refer to that as a way we as a human, as a generation could thrive, uh, could survive uh, in the years to come, uh, the next generation for us. So I would like to uh, ask about your perspective on how would be the best way for us to ensure that uh, our generation could all still live uh, in this world uh, especially using uh, through the approach of uh, built environment, as, especially uh, as in relation to the situation that we're currently facing. Uh, uh, what I refer to that, uh, as we already know, the world is uh, we just finished, we just uh, come to the end of this pandemic situation, and also the climate change that is uh, happening as an issue in a worldwide the war that is raging. Um, the world seems to be unpredictable at some point, and also it is uh, very much complex in that sense. So I would like to uh, know about your perspective on what, what, what would be the best way for us to uh, thrive as a generation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Pa Vishnu. And you direct your questions to all three presenters, right? Yes, exactly. All right, okay. thank, thank you. you. And the third uh, question is coming from, I, I know you, but I forgot your name. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, Imelda, okay. <laughs> She's my junior. <laughs> See, uh, good morning, it's such enlightenment presentation for me. Um, but uh, my first uh, questions will be go to uh, Bapak Pradipto. Uh, Pak Dipto, uh, I just uh, last week I just go, uh, when uh, I just come back from Sumba. Uh, when I see the rumah menara at Sumba and talk about uh, the vernacular uh, design for them, it's like uh, the way they make the axis is about dignity of the the no nobility, dignity of the the family. And today I uh, saw all your works, and then I uh, heard about the explanation. So when the position of the axis is moved from the original, so is it? Can we call it become a new vernacular, or it's still a vernacular architecture? I think that's my question for Pak Dipto. And uh, for, uh, can I call Bu Amila? <laughs> yeah, Bu Amila, uh, when we see uh, all the reads, yeah. Uh, so which one is the best for us now? Especially for Indonesia, we have uh, more than 60% is ocean, so I don't know how much uh, actually it will be, should remove for the next five years. Is there any, any suggestion for you? Is it, is it become a resort is the best one, yeah, financially and then maybe for sustainability framework? Uh, can you give us the, uh, what, is, what is the most uh, suitable uh, plan for us? Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Bu Emilda, Dr. Emilda. And you direct your questions uh, to Prof. Pratip and Dr. Amila, right? Okay. And the last uh, question is coming from uh, Anissa, Miss Anissa. And I think uh, she direct uh, her questions to you, Prof. Pratip. Uh, he, she asked about uh, in a traditional Bukis house, uh, South Sulawesi, there is a central pillar of the house called Posibola. Uh, as well as the access point and the first pillar that was built when the house was built. And the first pillar that was built uh, back when the house was uh, first built uh, is located in the middle or in the center of the traditional, of this traditional house. So do you think that this function of the pillar uh, dis uh, determine uh, the character of the access space? Okay, so we have uh, four questions uh, coming from four participants. Uh, the first uh, question uh, is directed toward uh, Dr. Ko, and the second uh, question uh, is directed toward the three, uh, our three presenters, and the third uh, question uh, is directed uh, toward uh, pa Pradeep and Dr. Amila, and the last question is directed toward uh, Prof. Pradeep. And we would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Ko uh, to uh, give uh, some uh, explanation or perhaps uh, answers regarding uh, the questions uh, from uh, Mr. Farid and also uh, Mr. Uh, Wisnu. Right, uh, thanks. Um, I think uh, to respond to the first question, um, so this, the question was that, uh, what's my suggestion for the next generation? on how to use machine learning, right? I think the question should be phrased maybe slightly differently. Uh, I think it's important for us to know, or rather the next generation to know, <clears throat> uh, not just how, but really when and when should we use it and why should we use it and what, uh, what do we use it for? Uh, which, uh, in order to answer this question, one has to kind of understand what's going on in, in, in the machine, right? Uh, before saying that they will make us uh, obsolete or that we will become de dependent on the machine. <clears throat> so I think the next generation, even uh, well, just speaking to, I don't know, there are probably a group, uh, this mix of architects, engineers, or planners here. Um, so it's, it's inevitable that machine learning, especially deep learning, is becoming part of the toolkit that we will use in the future, uh, whether they like it or not, uh, because they have proved themselves to be very effective, uh, useful. But I think unlike the computer scientists who are uh, responsible for designing this system, we are the one who, as designers, we should steer the direction of how these uh, techniques could be adapted uh, appropriated uh, for for our own uh, design tasks, right? Because as as architects, we are the very few uh, discipline that really consider a kind of a more holistic understanding of our design, meaning is social, economic, um, cultural impact, and of, of course, sustainability as well. And just to answer, <clears throat> uh, uh, statement about a uh, question about um, the dependence of machine, but in fact, we we have been dependent on machine for a long time, right? If you if you see machine as tools as like extension of the body, um, like you know the, the laptop, the, the pencil, they they are different forms of machine. But uh, what is so different now is that we're dealing with not a kind of a single functioning. Uh, a machine with no agency. We are talking about like you've probably seen on social media, uh, people posting a lot on, you know, uh, Dali and text to image generation. Lots of things are going on now, and it seems as if this machine has uh, agency to to do stuff that we used to think that only the creative human beings could do it. Uh, so this is quite interesting uh, that we should not ignore and it's important to understand uh, the mechanism behind it. Um, and to answer the second question, uh, which was quite a long question. Uh, what exactly is the second question? Uh, is it about the, 
Yeah, uh, Dudi, could, um, could you just asked, briefly? Yeah, uh, the second question, uh, especially uh, about uh, the potential of uh, the application of uh, machine learning or uh, new technology uh, that can help us uh, or that can guide us uh, in the future. Right. Is there, so is there any possibilities or perhaps uh, uh, shortcomings, perhaps uh, by uh, uh, through the utilization or the application of machine learning uh, for our uh, everyday life uh, in the future? Right. So I, I think for for designers is the the capacity of, of these systems to augment our way of thinking and working, working obviously because uh, it. Uh, we would it, like in the old days, right? If before the computers, you know, people just do the drafting, right? And then it changed. People start to just model it in in the computer, and therefore it it changed the way in which we conceive. Well, for, at least for architects, conceive form, right? It's no longer a projection of different uh, planes orthogonally, but the whole thing as in a three D space. <clears throat> but now we are witnessing even more complicated convergence of not just uh, of AI, machine learning, deep learning, with new things like the, the blockchain, the metaverse. Uh, and you even see people like quite recently, uh, I invited uh, this uh, Ar uh, Arif Khan who coined or, or in invented this idea of the intelligent NFTs. Right, the non-fungible uh, tokens uh, in blockchain. And he apparently <clears throat> added intelligent uh, avatars uh, within the metaverse, uh, which you could train and evolve on its own as well into its own, imagine a, a kind of a full-bodied uh, chatbot that could speak uh, with great intelligence. Uh, so we're reaching that point where it's become quite scary that these are converging and and we're still kind of at least in the architecture school still you know wrapping our head around to figure out you know why is machine learning why is deep learning um, so we we should be uh, looking at, across a kind of broader view of the convergence of AI with many other things currently yeah this this is my quick answer yeah. Just leave time for the other <laughs> speakers. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Koh. And uh, your explanation uh, reminded me of a novel and also that it's translated uh, into a movie by Steven Spielberg uh, a few years ago. So do you think that uh, Ready Player One, uh, we can uh, envision Ready Player One um, some uh, a few years uh, later from now? I'm just, I'm just. Well, the thing is, the, the researchers are going, try to go beyond the disembodiment, right? Right. I mean, the disembodiment, I mean, if you look at AI research, they are trying to somehow, even designing hardware devices where you could be more, you know, you could move your hands and whatsoever, more embodied in that virtual metaverse, uh, meta world. Uh, so I, I don't think we're going in that direction. And I also don't think that metaverse is necessarily or AI enabled metaverse is necessarily about VR. Uh, I think AR is more interesting because it's this combination of the physical and the virtual. Uh, nobody really want to like to you know wear that headset. No, I, I don't enjoy wearing it. And there is you know research show, showing that beyond a certain amount of time, you just you just go dizzy. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Ko. And let us give applause uh, to Dr. Ko first before we move to uh, Dr. Amila. And Dr. Amila, uh, we have uh, two uh, questions coming from uh, our participants, and I would like uh, you to perhaps give us your insight regarding uh, those uh, questions. Okay. I'll address the second question first. <laughs> the first question was long. I, I'll come back to you. The second question about uh, what is best uh, for the com offshore structure for Indonesia. Yeah? Um, there is no short answer to that uh, because uh, the com is still something very new. There's a lot of data that is not available for um, researchers or uh, designers, architects to work with, right? 
Uh, in the example of Malaysia, when we do the rigs to reef study, assessing the existing reef uh, suitability to be turned into rigs on site, eh, rigs to reef on site, we actually conduct a bio, uh, hydrodynamic modeling for platform in Malaysia water. Um, what do you call this? Um, putting together modeling that use biodiversity data with engineering data, the structure itself. You assess the structure safety, uh, the structure configuration when you uh, put it in the seabed, and you also do the modeling of the coral spawning, traveling, settling down, and coral takes seven years to mature, to know whether they will grow or they will just die, you know? So for me, if you want to know what is best for Indonesia, you have to start with collecting data, doing study. So we started that for Malaysia. The, the modeling was the most advanced for the um, Malaysian waters at this point of time. So now we have, we know which platform candidate is suitable for rigs in situ and which that you need to tow to a reefing site. Uh, so we have that part. So those candidate, now we need to study if the coral actually grow when you when you leave it on site. And whatever platform that is not identified as the coral spawning route, those are the candidate that you either turn it into repurpose or reuse, or you just have to remove it completely. Uh, so for Indonesia, you have 600 candidates to work with, and um, the region, the geographical region is actually um, widespread, yeah? from Sumatra to Sulawesi, I think to Kalimantan up. Uh, so you've got a lot of area and a lot of research to be done. So there's no yes or no. What is best? I don't have that for now. The, sec the first question, what yeah. was it? Yeah. Lesson learned. Lesson learned, yeah, OK. Ah, yes, uh, now I remember. As you were asking question, I was thinking, <laughs> if you were to ask me, my response would be what we are doing today is the way forward for, towards sustainability. It's another step towards sustainability that from a field that the architect does not know about, now I hope that I already got your, you in, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Subscribe. I'm all, in. <laughs> <laughs> all in. So I'm looking for the others to come on board. So that's the way forward towards sustainability for me, from, in my perspective. Mm. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Amila. And again, let us give applause to uh, Dr. Amila. <laughs> and then I would like to ask uh, Prof. Pratif uh, to give your insight and also comment uh, to uh, I think uh, we have two questions coming from Pak Vishnu and also uh, Dr. Emilda. Uh, thank you. Vielen <coughs> Dank. Uh, yeah, there's if spread out for uh, a yeah, of English and <laughs> or <toy. laughs> This is my English is so <laughs> That's about the sustainable, yeah. Uh, sustainable uh, vernacular house. <coughs> this is the minor finding. This is the uh, characteristic of on this uh, sustainable uh, this, this development. Uh, vernacular uh, architecture is at the center. That is the the, 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 the first, yeah. That is the center. That is center. That is uh, by the Mapping of uh, traditional Java is has uh, the Monchopat. Monchopat this is in a four for a rhythm and one in a pool and center. Yeah, that is transcendent. That is transcendent. That is so we uh, east, west, north, and then south. And then is uh, middle. This is our center. That is had our I know projection. That is an attendance. Yeah, pan open like half gods. This is an uh, pattern on the Javanese uh, uh, culture. Yeah, pattern on the Javanese culture. <coughs> now this uh, uh, pattern, this model, uh, uh, I have. Uh, that is not no Java, but it uh, in another, uh, another, uh, another uh, house, vernacular house in Sumatra. Oh yeah, Enias, 
uh, in Padang ya order in uh, middle Indonesian that is by Bugis ya pun au di Toraja eh uh, kita also by dem uh, East Java this is by dem uh, Malaka or Belu this is the same ya yeah. saya bisa ke uh, obat the same that is di uh, middle the family room this is di central daripada house pas uh, alves ya yeah. imer uh, had an uh, direct contact and then reach pole This is that is so that is I uh, this, uh, the character spawn them uh vernacular house. Yeah. <coughs> uh so is that spawn this uh uh, uh, uh finding have uh, uh, uh uh apa perbandingkan ya. Compare ya, compare in another another, uh, another uh, place ya. Jadi sebelum kampung naga, jadi kampung naga in Tasik Malaya, jadi West Java, jadi not in a vernacular ya, arsitektur sonder, but nanti tradisional ya, tradisional house. Apa uh, di tradisional hat hat on a stock of fat ya. Jadi uh, di center, jadi uh, di family uh, room, jadi ni bedroom center, ya. Yeah. Sondor bedroom eight. Jadi bedroom uh, bedroom holy place, ya. Jadi jadi ni bedroom center, ya. Yeah. Sondor so, bedroom eight. In our bedroom uh, in Nusa Tenggara Barat, the West uh, Nusa Tenggara, pada Sengada, that's the same, ya. Yeah. This is Sengada had an same uh, patterns uh, uh, house with them Kampung Naga. That is the central house, ni central house, ya, yeah, central room. That is need bedroom center, so the bedroom egg. So for this uh, for this uh, finding, happy ah, uh, I know, I know, I did, yeah. This I think for that basis the uh, access, at the read uh, access room. This is need not even uh, always bedroom center. So couldn't wear out. Masman on center, abar batkan all ego. This meaning, this is the uh, uh, for this uh, and vehicle, for this uh, development, for this uh, sustainable. Yeah, that is the, the uh, pole. Yeah, the ex room can all be weaken, can all remove, can all sweep. Yeah, in under place, not. Uh, Just in center, at middle. Ada bedim uh, ngaga ada subang uh, not ya yeah, not karena tau uh, bedim ego. Tapi sekarang tau bebek, kan sebebek. So is that. This is this is uh, uh, finding happy ya tau so uh, clear, er clear. This is the uh, exit atau rigid ya yeah. rope access ya. Yeah. Kan au ni in center, ya kan au bewek, ya. So we by them church, ya by them church that is gereja di bambu. This is the central room. This is ni by them center, sonder by them echo, by them corner, ya, by them corner. But this is the principal. This is the room. Most uh, even had any direct contact with them open. That is center, yeah. Not even in center, but cut off in a cup. But uh, the room center must, yeah, have to uh, any uh, direct contact or linear, yeah, any linear under 
uh, tip ya under uh, rich pool ya yeah, under rich pool ya so is that ya kenal sebagai sumba ya dari sumba op di sumba di vernacular ya vernacular arsitektur kan au Ben so di se apa Rupert Access bebek ya kan operasif ada sah. Jadi obdas di noh apa tradisional ya noh vernacular atau tradisional. That is good ya. That is true. That is that is that is dia tetap tetap di dalam film well is a characteristic of the uh, vernacular house this is the middle house middle room had an direct contact with the pool with the uh, rigid pool so it has a characteristic yeah so of this uh, uh, perceived that perceived is a uh, center that is kind of problem this is not no Oh, bedem. Ya, so we bedem main desain, ya, ya. That's it, naturally, ya. That's it, net, not just, ya, not just, just that, but di tradisional house, ya, basis in Sumba, in Sumatera, in Aau di Belu, hat Aau aina kultur, ya, hat Aau aina special klima, ya. So dan kan aw aw combine ya, that is aw combine on aw development that is this principle of that ya. Okay. Jadi boleh dan disebut tetap sebagai vernacular tetap boleh ya. Betul ya, tetap vernacular tetap. So yeah, to summarize what Prof Pradip already described, even though the roof axis is move. Not on top of the living room or the family room, uh, it is still be, can be called as a vernacular architecture. So, despite despite the displacement of the the location of the roof axis, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Pradip. And just wondering, I think we still have a uh, ten minute left, right? Right? No? We're running out of time. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Uh, the organizing committee just informed us that uh, we are already running out of time. So uh, with uh, apology to all participants and also uh, 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 the offline participant and also uh, participant who participate uh, through online platform who might uh, have uh, perhaps uh, questions that still linger, uh, uh, you can uh, write, write uh, to us and, and we will try to uh, convey your questions uh, directly to our uh, distinguished speakers. And to summarize our uh, today's session, this morning session, we have a, a wonderful discussion, a fruitful discussion uh, coming from uh, the presentation of Dr. Emmanuel Ko and also uh, from Dr. Amila Zawawi and the last presentation uh, coming from uh, Prof. Uh, Pradip Tho. And those three uh, speakers, uh, they touch upon a specific um, aspect uh, Dr. Emmanuel Ko uh, intrigue us with uh, how we can use and utilize uh, machine learning uh, in, uh, in the planning and design process uh, that can help us, guide us through uh, the development and also uh, the deployment of certain aspects of the architecture and planning. While Dr. Amila uh, sparked our interest uh, with the, her, her involvement uh, in the oil rig uh, decommissioning project and she showed us what can be done and what the future holds uh, for, uh, especially for architect and uh, civil engineer and uh, the collaboration between these two uh, fields of study. While Prof. Pradip uh, illustrate uh, uh, the, the, the application of the traditional value and how this traditional value can be utilized and can be uh, used uh, for the modern design of our contemporary uh, house and uh, building. Again, uh, applause for all three uh, distinguished speakers and we can conclude our this morning session and I would like to return um, to the host.
Thank you so much, Mr. Dodi, for conducting a very insightful moderating. And also, to express our gratitude towards the moderator and the panels that have joined us today, we would like to invite uh, Dr. Trimulyani Sunar Harum to present the token of appreciation on stage. Firstly, we would like to present the first gift to our speakers. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, to our moderator, the Honorable Dodi Aiskandar. Okay, the next one is a token of appreciation for the first speaker from Malaysia, which is Dr. Nur Amilawan Abdullah Zawawi. The next one for Professor Dr. Ing, Insignor Eugenius Pradipto. Okay. And last but not least, uh, an online appreciation for uh, Professor Koch. Okay, that's all for the token appreciation session. Thank you so much uh, for the invited speakers and the moderator that we have invited in the stage. And the next session is a documentation session. So for the participants and also from Indonesia and Malaysia as well, you may uh, go to the stage for uh, we will take the picture together. Yes. Okay, the first uh, picture that we will take is the pictures uh, for the invited speakers and the moderators. We also invite the head of the Department of Architecture and Planning to the stage for the documentation session. And also the invited um, audience participants from Malaysia as well. After this, uh, if there is anyone else who wants to join us, we can let's take a picture. We also invite the participants and the audience of this room to take a place in front of the stage to take a documentation session with the invited speakers and also the moderator.
For the remaining participants, please join us on stage as we will take the picture very soon. Thank you everyone for joining us and ladies and gentlemen Ladies and gentlemen, this photo station marks the end of our first agenda today. And we will, we're glad to announce that you guys will have a 10 minutes coffee break and networking session after this. Please remember that we'll continue our next agenda for the panel discussion at 25 minutes past 10 a.m. And the mobilization will be led by the relation officers of 6 of 2022. And the agenda will be run into uh, the K1, K2, K3, K4 room. And also we would like to announce that the Zoom link of the panel discussion will be sent through this ch uh, chat box for the online participants. And also please be sure to take your attendance and in all of the panel discussions as it is the requirement for the participants to get their certificates and also would like to announce that it is also the uh, voting station for the participants in front of this room so please vote uh, the best and the most preferable design of the poster based on your um, knowledge and yeah that's all for this session thank you and see you at the next session guys see you. thank you Ha, ha, ha.